Hello, and, and welcome to today's discussion, Pop Culture, Terror, Warfare, and Sexual Violence, the case of Sierra Leone. My name is Ariella Blatter, and I'm the president and CEO of Women in International Security, also known as WISE. WISE is a non-governmental organization that achieves gender equality by helping women advance as leaders in the international peace and security sector. WISE is a non-governmental organization that achieves this gender equality for the last 35 years as a unique global organization supporting professional growth opportunities for women, leading gender equality research projects and policy engagement initiatives, nurturing a community of powerful security advocates, expert leaders, and mentors. Our network spans nearly 50 countries across six continents and includes 60 supporters committed to gen closing the gender equality gap worldwide. Our event today centers around Dr. Mark Summers' latest book, we the Young Fighters, Pop Culture, Terror, and the War in Sierra Leone. And for those of you who are members of WISE, the membership code 30% off will be in the chat. And we encourage those of you who are not yet members to please join our organization. The information is currently in the chat function. Today, we will explore the gender dynamics of war, particularly the widespread prevalence and response to conflict-related sexual violence. My job today is to welcome our moderator, Dr. Chantal de Jong Udrat. Uh, Chantal is a global fellow at the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Wilson Center. She served as the president and CEO of WISE from February 2013 to July 2021 and is currently a member of our board of directors. Um, Chantal has also published feature. Uh, pieces in international security and gender and WPS issues. Uh, her latest publication that I want you to know about is a gender and security agenda, which she published with Dr. Michael Brown with Routledge in 2020. Also have a, a discount available for our WISE members and a forthcoming book on men, masculinity as, and security is coming. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Chantal Dung Udrat, over to you as our moderator, who will also introduce our esteemed panelists today. Thank you, Chantal. Thank Flores. you very, thank you very much, Ariella. Uh, you know, it's my great pleasure to introduce the speakers of today. Uh, first off, Mark Sommers, who is the author of "We the Young, the Young Fighters: Pop Culture, Terror, and War in Sierra Leone." Uh, Mark is an anthropologist uh, and has throughout his work really married uh, work in the field with teaching, academic writing, and policy engagement. Uh, and you are one of the rare people that I know who do that very well and make those bridges between these different arenas. Uh, Mark is also somebody who pioneered work on young men in conflict situations and shape programs of the US government as well as the UN. Uh, not surprisingly, Mark was also a very influential member of the UN group of experts on youth, peace, and security. Uh, we'll propose to give Mark uh, some 15, 20 minutes to uh, introduce the main arguments of his book. Uh, and after that, we'll give the floor to Dara K. Cohen and Ali Bitenga. Alexandre. Uh, Dara is professor at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, she's a political scientist, and I would say one of the foremost experts on conflict-related sexual violence. Her work, and particularly her book, Rape During Civil War, uh, has called attention that to the fact that conflict-related sexual violence is not an inevitable consequence of war, and she has shown that there's actually quite some variation. Ali uh, Bitenga Alexandre is a researcher and has worked with the Penzi Foundation, the foundation created by Nobel Peace Prize winner Dennis Mugwege. And he is a collaborator of Informed International, a research and consultancy organization. He's based in the DRC, and his research has really focused on the perpetrators of conflict-related sexual violence, as well as on male survivors. Uh, he also provides technical support to community-based programs in the DRC. And Ali, congratulations with your uh, recent article in Global Public Health on 
uh, the experiences of male survivors. Uh, I want to add that both Dara and Ali are part of the Missing Peace Network, a global scholarly network that is focused on uh, conflict-related sexual violence. Um, now, before we turn to uh, Mark Summers, a few housekeeping issues. Um, unfortunately, WISE doesn't have the capacity to have all your faces on the screen. Uh, but we do hope that we can have an interactive uh, meeting. And I really encourage you to use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen and encourage you to make comments and ask questions. Um, the bios of all the participants, the full bios can be found in the chat. And um, as Ariella said, uh, the book can be... Um, can be bought with a discount for um, for WISE members. So without further ado, Mark, the floor is yours or the screen is yours, I should say. Thank you very much, Chantal. Thanks, Ariella and uh, Roxana at WISE. Um, thanks, Dara and, and Ali for making time to contribute and to everyone who's made time to, to join us today. I'm going to see if I can do my screen share and we can get started. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things about the book. There's a lot of issues that are covered um, in We the Young Fighters. And the, the two that I'm going to talk about is the issues of alienation and how terror war warfare works, how they work together, youth alienation, and then to dig deep into the issue of why sexual violence in Sierra Leone was so intense and kind of obsessive uh, as, a, as an element of the war and the terror-based warfare that was the way it was fought. So I, I'm first going to talk a little bit about, to put it, to put it in context, this issue of um, uh, pop culture uh, heroes and why they were so important to alienated youth in Sierra Leone. And then we'll get to their exploitation. So. This is an important issue that pop culture superstars are interpreted locally, but you can't predict how they're going to be used. Um, it, it is unpredictable. Um, there are three pop culture icons that that came together in Sierra Leone to be extremely influential um, on young people and on the course of the war and also on on the peace that followed after the war. So globally, why is Bob Marley so important globally to this day? Um, he really does inspire this analysis, of in, analysis of injustice, an act of resistance. A follower smokes marijuana. So for, marijuana smoking is sacramental and part of practice of Rastafarianism and the follower and being a follower of Marley himself. This is a global, these are global issues. Um, Tupac, um, is is the fearless one he's the one who who who, who put, pushes back and is never embarrassed is defiant uh, against the system and in that way he's heroic in a different way for young people than marley and then you have the the, the rambo character whose movies were incredibly important and influential globally particularly in the 1980s but into the 1990s and what he showed, the, the reference to Vietnam had no influence in most of the world, but what he showed is that you could be a one-man army. And another thing that was important for Sierra Leone is that the first two films take place in rainforests, which is, uh, for Sierra Leone, is also a rainforest. Um, so what about youth? They really had no way out and, and uh, to understand um, the post-slave trade era, the Atlantic slave trade. The, 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 the dynamic that really had a major impact to this day on Sierra Leone is that the Portuguese and then particularly the British who did it, uh, who had slave trade for the longest, they focused on taking out men they, they, as slaves. Uh, very few women, very few females. What did that do? It created this uh, sexual imbalance, gender imbalance in societies. There was a surplus of females and so they had to be um, uh, subordinated and controlled, but there also was this view that feminine power was dangerous, very dangerous. 
wild, raw, all kinds of words like that are used to refer to it. And then boys got taken into these conflicts, these constant conflicts over whoever lost was taken as a slave. Um, so the boys, this whole pattern of being pressed into fighting, pressed into do the dirty work, the violence for your, your leaders is something that happened centuries ago and has stayed in Sierra Leone as a tradition to this day. The issue of emasculation is a major um, theme throughout Sierra Leonean history. It's difficult for boys to marry. Um, they are, their, their labor is controlled in marriages. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details, but even when they run away from, from villages and go to the diamond mines, it's virtually forced labor there too. And a key thing, a key issue is that they're often put, looked down upon as thugs. That's a big word or a tug seen as bad people, inherently bad people. This is for a large swath of male youth in Sierra Leone. This has been going on for quite a while. So to the pre-war era, this is now Sierra Leone as, as an independent nation and starting in the 60s. Um, Shaka Stevens came in as the third ruler and was there for almost 20 years. Um, he ran the government as a business, and, and I use the, the phrase it, that it was a fake state. The country, the, the government was intentionally weak. Um, he didn't get put much money into the, the institutions of government. He did invest in state violence, in, in institutions that he could control that carried out um, his violence. Because of course, when you steal everything or practically everything, there's a lot of people who don't like that. So you use state violence to keep everything in place. A key part a dynamic in Sierra Leone that's important is that the Creole language, which came from freed slaves, the Creole, um, is a, a version of English. And why this was important is that as the lingua franca of the country, everybody can understand English. And that's very important. Marley sings slowly. He wants you to hear his lyrics. Rambo doesn't say much in his movies. So it's easy to, for even children to pick up what's going on um, in both the movies of Rambo, songs of Marley, and to a certain extent, um, uh, Tupac's songs. And then the issue of peaceful dissent was harshly repressed. I'm just going to briefly go through an alternate view of history from the perspective of young people in Sierra Leone. And this, so the, in the 1960s, the late 1960s, marijuana comes into the country and it, and it, it just it grows so easily and it's a version of a marijuana. And then in the 1970s, repressed youth, particularly in Freetown, were looking for other voices to inspire them, to validate them, and they found reggae music, and then in particular, um, Bob Marley. And it's intentional that I put a picture of Marley smoking a spleef, that the issue of when you're a follower of Marley, you smoke marijuana, and you, you try to understand the injustice that is controlling you. Um, that's because a practice of becoming conscious of the injustice that surrounds you. Um, Marley, to this day, is extremely influential and popular, not just in Sierra Leone, but at least the three Rambo movies came in. Um, the first one seemed to be particularly um, influential in Sierra Leone. Um, and in, uh, he was identified by female youth, he was important, as well as male youth. Um, for reasons I'll get to in a moment. And then there's Tupac who comes in in the 90s. I put in a picture where he has the, um, his, his, uh, uh, the tattoo on his torso saying thug life. That's important because Sierra Leonean male youth were called thugs or tugs, all their guy who's proud of being a thug. So even before they, they saw, when they saw this picture and even before they heard Tupac's music, he was a hero he wasn't afraid he wasn't embarrassed about being a thug so what how do you put this together why these three why were they so important in sierra leone um youth turned to marley for inspiration um tupac was like a friend of theirs from another part of the world and john rambo's movies were pedagogical they provided instruction on what to do when things were when, when you were really up against it 
So the shared messages, and they're in all of the works, the works of all three, uh, well, Mar uh, Rambo is not really an artist, but a character, but the other two are major artists. Um, we're blamed, but we didn't do anything. Those in power are against us and forcing us to resist. It's not our idea to resist. We have to. Um, so the world is perverse. It's a perverse universe we're living in. Everything's upside down. Okay, then war takes off and uh, the rebels in particular exploit the popularity of these three, of this trio. It would have been very difficult not to, to um, draw in and exploit them because they're, they really did permeate the world of young people in Sierra Leone. Um, particularly Marley. Marley was taken as the inspirational leader of the rebels, the coup government that took over in 1992. He was the inspirational leader of, of the government as well for quite a while uh, during the war. And then they exploited the youth that they captured. Almost everybody was abducted. Um, it was, it was um, everything was, even the fighters uh, were uh, captured and controlled and raped to a, a very high degree uh, as well. The boys were drugged heavily and manipulated to become weapons of terror. They often went into battle uh, into, well, to attack uh, civilians, not even knowing where they were or what they were doing. Uh, and, uh, so the other thing was to exploit the weaknesses in governance, which came up with, particularly with Shaka Stevens, to terrorize civilians. But in terror warfare, this, this was terror-based warfare. You don't focus on really wiping out the other side or in the Balkans during um, during wars there. This focus is very different. You, you, you don't kill many um, uh, but you terrorize as many as possible. And this is a, this is a, a, a key instrument of, of sexual violence in this kind of war. You avoid fighting opposition forces, conventional militaries, because you're going to get wiped out. You're mostly kids and they're on drugs. So you, you try to keep them away and then you crawl, uh, control natural resources. The diamonds were of very high quality coming out of the rebels for the entire war. Okay, sexual violence. Why was it so obsessive? Why was it so unusually focused? The, the rebels in particular, but by the end of the war, all sides of the war, all of them were, were incredibly focused on um, a sexual violence. This was more than just one of the things that rebels did, for example. Um, so the, the, the focus on uh, slave enslaving captured females was really a big deal. And that's the experience of females. It was so male-centered, the, the, uh, the rebels, that they promised nothing to the, if they won or when they won, nothing was going to be given to any woman in the country. This is very different from many other rebel movements uh, in recent history. Uh, so I looked into the, my data very carefully, uh, and I also looked into uh, research on this issue to try to find out why was it so unusually, um, was it, and I came up with five possible reasons. The first one and the most mentioned in my uh, interviews was drugs, that, that the rebels were, uh, the, the soldiers, the men were more violent, more aggressive when they were high on drugs. The second one is contested that they were ordered to rape. I'm not sure that they, I, I think that it's clear that rape was condoned by military leaders. Was it necessary to order it? Some say yes, some say no. Uh, what's clear is they didn't try to stop it. Um, then there's the issue of porn. Um, this has come up in other uh, uh, war zones as well. Um, pornography certainly was, videos, porn videos were certainly being watched by rebels and they enacted sexual practices from those uh, videos that had never been seen in the history of Sierra Leone. And so those practices became an instrument of terror as well. Um, and then th this whole issue, which I think is by itself rather mechanistic, which is most male youth were unable to marry, which is true. Um, and that now they have this incredible opportunity to have sex and to marry when there was food 
uh, the rebels could marry, say, let's say four wives. They could take four wives. Um, uh, the the last issue that I'm going that came up is goes back to the slave era, which is this issue of dangerous feminine power. Uh, one of the things that came out is that um, what was the most terrifying warrior when, in, during interviews, particularly with men who were the male civilians? Well, it was a pregnant woman who was castrating um, men. That was that image of a rebel fighter was the most terrifying. So you have this issue of feminine power and of, of the danger of feminine power and that women must be domesticated and controlled, that they're raw and wild, that femininity, that goes back to the, to the slave era. And it's, it appears to be one of the uh, underlying reasons for the uh, unusual intensity of sexual violence during uh, the war. Just briefly on the post-war era, um, Sierra Leone for the first time in its history became a real democracy. Um, last year's election, uh, not so much. That one is contested up to this point. Um, the Paramount Chiefs, which was one of the main reasons for the war there, that basically they could control rural areas, their chiefdoms um, with impunity. Uh, international actors, particularly the British government, put them right back in power. So the structures that were causes of the civil war uh, in Sierra Leone were reinstated um, after the war. Another thing that happened after the war was really remarkably strong generational separation. Um, young uh, males and females didn't really, the relationships of being sort of having no voice and doing what you're told and having uh, be, being controlled by your parents, that seemed to be over. And there was tremendous urban migration out of rural areas after the war by young people. And then no matter what, youth were still on the margins. A common um, occupation for former rebel wives um, is to be a commercial sex worker. Uh, and because you can bring your children, and one of the reasons is you can bring your children to work. Um, and a large number of, of prostitutes that I interviewed were uh, sexual, um, were former rebels. In some cases, every single one of them in a particular area. Male youth, again, they were, went into the mines and cities. When they went into cities, they were seen as thugs quite often. When they went into the mines, their labor was controlled to a very high degree. Um, what happened to Marley, Tupac, and Rambo? Rambo's influence after about 2005 seemed to really wane. Um, uh, Tupac became, uh, uh, came back as somebody for male youth to really look to. I put a quote here, there are so many sufferers, that's also a, a, a term that Marley uses, the sufferer. Um, I used to hear from people who succeeded like Tupac, I'm from nowhere, but someday I can make it. Tupac is an example for us. And Marley, his influence was even greater, and most certainly with female youth as well as male youth, but also with adults. Um, he, his ideas about resisting repression and standing up for yourself. The most important song during the war was Get Up, Stand Up. The most important song after the war was Get Up, Stand Up, but it was reinterpreted to mean that you stand up for yourself and that is don't give up. And so you had Marley and Tupac coming back to validate and support the young people who, on the margins who were really being put down once again Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And uh, it's really interesting how these foreign popular, uh, you know, artists and icons became a real uh, factor in the war in Sierra Leone. I'd like to give the floor to Dara Cohen. Uh, Dara Sierra Leone was also one of your case studies. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to ask you, you know, about the uh, the factors that uh, Mark proposes in terms of, you know, why sexual violence was so widespread in Sierra Leone, and he distinguishes between structural factors and, and more direct factors. Dara, over to you. Just like in the, in the pre-war era. 
So I'm going to leave it there and turn it back over to Chantal. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much, Chantal. Um, and thank you to WISE for inviting me to be part of this wonderful discussion. Um, and congratulations to Mark on this incredible new book. Um, it was just such a pleasure to read. Um, uh, Sierra Leone is a case that I care a lot about. It's where I did the majority of my research for my dissertation, which became my first book. And um, I learned a lot, even knowing a lot coming into <laughs> um, reading the book. I learned a lot from reading the book. So I thank you for that, Mark. Um, yeah, I think I'll just start briefly with a, a few comments about um, uh, what I think scholars of conflict-related sexual violence um, can learn from this book and maybe put Sierra Leone also into a broader global context. Um, first is that Sierra Leone, I think, um, is a case that is widely acknowledged to have been a case of just mass rape, very widespread reports of conflict-related sexual violence of multiple forms, including rape, including gang rape, um, and that this uh, sexual violence was mainly committed by the RUF rebels. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this perhaps later um, in the session with some different comments, but I think the fact that it was mainly committed, not exclusively, but mainly committed by the RUF rebels, raises a really important puzzle that a number of scholars, including myself, have tried to harness in understanding some of the root causes, um, whether they're structural or um, otherwise. Uh, and I think the puzzle is that, and Mark notes this in his book as well, there was um, maybe even an unusual extent of, uh, I think what, how Mark fra frames it is factional fluidity uh, across the armed groups that were fighting in the Sierra Leone Civil War, which essentially means that these were the same people um, fighting in the various armed groups that were engaged in the conflict. And yet, most of the sexual violence was perpetrated by the RUF, by one of the armed groups. So I, I'll return to that maybe a little bit later um, in the session today, but I think that's a, that's a really important puzzle for us. Uh, the conventional wisdom, which I argue in some of my work, is limited in some of its explanatory power, is that one of the reasons why rape was so, or con sexual violence, conflict-related sexual violence was so extreme in the Sierra Leone case, is that it was both opportunistic um, especially, like I was saying before, violence by the rebel groups, um, and that it was strategic. Um, and so there are some who have argued that, you know, it's part of a kind of broader set of strategic violence, uh, another example of which is the practice of amputating limbs, that this was symbolic and strategic and sort of had a broader purpose. Um, again, I think both of these arguments are limited in some important ways. What Mark does in his book that I thought that I think is so important and illuminating for scholars of conflict related sexual violence is he really brings out he talked through um, these five factors that he has highlighted. I want to say just in my introductory comments, I want to comment in particular about two of them, um, uh, which is drugs and pornography. Um, but I want to say just in framing these comments that some of these factors have kind of lurked in the background of a lot of research on conflict related sexual violence in general and on Sierra Leone in particular, but haven't really before been brought to the fore of how we might understand um, the forms of violence that took place and some of the underlying reasons. And I think in part this is because the broader literature has tended to focus on um, what I'm going to call rationalist logics, um, has kind of uh, analyzed sexual violence as a, quote, strategy of war, and has maybe um, given too much credit, I suppose, in some ways, to armed groups for uh, perpetrating even massive levels of sexual violence, but sort of reading it through the lens of this must have a larger military purpose or strategic purpose. And I think one of the important parts of Mark's, Mark's uh, book and his argument is that it, it nuances that, it complicates it, um, and it sort of uh, helps us understand, I think, through all of the incredible fieldwork and interviewing that Mark has done, uh, what how the fighters themselves, how the ex-combatants themselves explain and understand um, the sexual violence that they were involved in. Um, so let me say just a couple of comments first on drugs and then on pornography, and then I will turn the floor back over. Um, first, on the issue of drugs, I think this is such an important topic, both in terms of understanding political violence and wartime atrocities in general, but perhaps especially in terms of understanding 
um, sexual violence and extreme forms, extremely brutal forms of sexual violence of the type that we have seen in the Sierra Leone conflict. Um, it's incredibly understudied. We just don't know that much about this. And as I was saying, it sort of lurks in the background of a lot of analyses of even extreme forms of wartime sexual violence in other cases. And so it's reported in the Sierra Leone context, as we've heard from Mark. Um, it's reported in um, East Timor, where I have also done field work. There were all kinds of rumors about um, uh, amphetamines being shared with uh, a Timorese militias by the Indonesian uh, state forces. Um, there are um, there are stories. There's actually a fascinating uh, new book by Edward Westerman about uh, Nazis' use of alcohol um, and its role both in genocidal violence in general, but also in sexual violence. Uh, so I think there's a lot uh, there, and it hasn't really been, I think, fully integrated into the research on sexual violence. And so I thought this was an, a really important topic for scholars to kind of contend with. In part, I think not only does it help us understand um, potentially or sort of nuance these more uh, strategic arguments about sexual violence, but for me, it also helps me uh, make sense of a puzzle that I'm, I'm, I'm often sort of pondering about the cases that I study, um, which is how do we explain why some forms of sexual violence are so incredibly brutal, right? It's, it's sort of beyond what, um, it's beyond quote, just sex, right? It's, it often involves um, mutilation and other forms of violence that are extremely brutal. And so I think the use of drugs of various types can help us at least understand more about the broader context and how drugs might lower sort of natural human inhibition towards um, en enacting those forms of violence. Um, and so what we learned from Mark, I think, in particular about Sierra Leone is that the, the drugs in Sierra Leone, um, which I had sort of, again, sort of heard rumors about, but never quite articulated so clearly in this particular case, is that the marijuana in this case, I understand from Mark, was just an incredibly strong strain of marijuana and that it was laced with amphetamines. And so it, I, for me, that sort of helped me understand a little bit more about was, what was going on in the background context. Um, I think in terms of lessons for, for scholarship, it helps us maybe um, think of some new research questions that we might wanna explore in the future, including how the use of drugs, like what are the drugs that have been used to sort of um, facilitate the process of extreme forms of sexual violence across cases, across contexts? Um, how, do how does this vary? Um, and Potentially also, I don't think it's necessarily the use of drugs is necessarily a counter argument to the idea of rape as a strategy of war. Um, it, as in the rumors in the East Timor case, there at least the story was often that it was given as part of a strategy for um, lowering inhibitions, it kind of in anticipation of um, the perpetration of extreme forms of violence. Uh, so it's not necessarily separate from strategic arguments, but I think it helps us again understand the scale and brutality of the violence. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to talk briefly about is the issue of pornography. Um, and I was really interested in sort of Mark's argument about that as a factor in this particular case. It's again something that sort of lurks in the background of some of the other, some other research of other cases. Uh, and so even as early as 1993, there's a kind of famous article that uh, Catherine McKinnon, the feminist legal scholar, wrote in Ms. Magazine about pornography in the Bosnian context. So this is something, this is an argument that she made both about how pornography in that context inspired some of the sexual violence that occurred. And also she argued that there was some evidence, and I should say that this is somewhat contested, but um, this was the argument she made in 1993, that the sexual violence there was recorded and then kind of sold or used as itself as a form of pornography. Um, and so kind of two connections there to pornography. So it's something that I think scholars of sexual violence, again, have kind of been aware of and has sort of lurked in the background, but um, Mark kind of brings it uh, to our attention in, in this particular case. I, one of the uh, connections, I think, to some broader conversations that are happening in the conflict-related sexual violence scholarship world is that I think when we're considering pornography and its relationship to conflict-related sexual violence, it does what some of my colleagues, um, I'm thinking in particular of Maria Erickson Vaz and Maria Stern, um, uh, term bringing the sexual back into sexual violence, 
right? Um, and they have this fascinating article that's uh, appeared in 2018 in the International Feminist Journal of Politics entitled Curious, Erase Curious Erasures, the Sexual and Wartime Sexual Violence, where they're essentially making the argument that uh, a lot of scholars um, and practitioners and policymakers have sort of ignored the sexual aspects. Um, and uh, they are uh, trying to make the case that we ought to bring that back into some of our understandings. And so I think in part, that's what Mark is doing by calling again our attention to the role of, of pornography in this particular case. Now, similar to what I um, said about drugs, I think this is such a rich um, and understudied uh, aspect of conflict-related sexual violence. And one question I had as someone engaged in this research is that pornography is incredibly widely available and arguably even now more available than it was during the early 1990s during the Sierra Leone Civil War. Um, so I think there's just so many open questions about um, the ubiquity of pornography. Um, and I would argue the, 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 the relative rareness thankfully, of the kind of mass rape that we see in a context like Sierra Leone. So I, I think for me as a political scientist, it helps us, it's a it's a kind of um, background factor that may explain the, the, the way sexual violence looks in certain cases, but is not um, monocausal. And I, that's, I just want to say that um, I know Mark is very careful in, in the book and the presentation of the factors to argue that there is no one cause of sexual violence in the Sierra Leone context. So I'm not suggesting that you made that argument, Mark, but I think it's helpful as part of a broader context for, under, for us to understand why sexual violence sometimes looks the way it does. Um, and I'll pause there for now. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dara. Uh, yeah, I also think, you know, when you're emphasizing porn and, and drugs, that also then uh, points us to, you know, more structural causes and in particular notions of masculinity uh, that are often also ignored when we're talking about conflict-related sexual violence. Ali, this is also a great segue to you because you focused a lot on issues of masculinity. Um, but before you do that, I wanted to ask you, you know, to what extent do these factors and the descriptions of Mark of conflict related sexual violence apply to the case of DRC? Uh, thank you very much, Chantal, for the floor. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to congratulate Mark for this important book uh, that uh, increases our understanding of causes, the motivations of, of sexual violence. Because for, for many years, sexual violence has been treated as, as been considered as a disease that should be treated at the hospital, uh, either psychologically or, 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 or medically. Uh, but reading Mark's uh, book, we understand that uh, sexual violence is a complex uh, uh, social problem. So uh, it it, uh, it it is it should not be it should not only be treated at the hospital, but to a, a broad uh, uh, at the a broad societal um, uh, level. And when I was reading uh, Mark's book, I was wondering if it didn't confuse the setting where he conducted uh, his research because. Most of the explanations he, he provided are applicable in the DRC uh, uh, as well, especially uh, from soldiers' point of view, but, but also from civilian point of view. Uh, uh, I'm going to start with the, 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 the drug issue that Mark uh, has pointed out. Uh, so with, with studies with soldiers in the DRC, soldiers have said that one of the causes of sexual violence is, 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 is drug. As if soldiers uh, take drug, they commit sexual violence uh, brutally. Uh, but what I want to mention is that uh, some soldiers do take drug, but they don't necessarily commit sexual violence. So it is not an automatic explanation. If you take drug, you, you endure it. Uh, some soldiers take drug and then rape, and others do, but uh, but they don't rape. But this drug uh, uh, explanation her, uh, has been uh, related by soldiers in the, in the DRC as well as uh, uh, by, by by civilians. Uh, 
Uh, and currently, what we observe in the DRC, so men, not only soldiers, but also civilians, take drugs to increase their sexual performance. And, 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 and I don't understand the, biologi uh, the, the biological uh, processes, but some men and, and soldiers die when, when doing it, the perpetrator, because it creates some problem on the heartbeats. And uh, so we have, we have some cases of people dying while uh, doing sexual intercourse, especially when they have taken drugs. Soldiers, uh, recently we heard of, of one soldier in Bukavu, but also some civilians. So it's a common. And this, is these drugs, uh, sometimes are locally made, but there are drugs which are imported from uh, from outside. We we have some drinks now in the DRC brought from imported from Europe, and uh, that's men enjoy uh, drinking, including soldier and civilian. And sometimes it leads to sexual violence, uh, to sexual violence, and and um, uh, and to death for for the perpetrator uh, as well. Uh, and also, Mark uh, uh, spoke about pornography. Uh, this the, the pornography uh, is a cause of sexual violence. Uh, so in, in the DRC, there is, uh, before the war, there, there were projections of pornography uh, cinemas in the community. And when the cinema was over, we, we heard of many stories of sexual violence in the, in the community, but young boys perpetrating sexual violence after watching pornography. And, and, and oftentimes, the, the actors of these uh, porn films are, are Western actors. So the, the, the people imitate the uh, sexual practices within, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, in the pornography film and they commit it on, on, on women. Uh, so yeah, so you understand here that the, the, the kind of foreign influence uh, uh, of sexual violence, not only in Sierra Leone, as Mark has pointed out, but also in the DR, uh, in the DRC. Uh, Mark also uh, uh, mentions strategic rape, like ordered rape. So uh, the, the the concept of ordered rape is is complex in 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 itself, because most often we think ordered rape is only for strategic reason, like soldiers want to neutralize or to demoralize enemies. But what I would like to mention here is that uh, sexual violence is oftentimes not directly ordered. So it is not a, 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 an explicit direct orders. It can, it can be implicit, very hidden order. Uh, for example, uh, uh, one soldier told me uh, that he has a commander who often told his soldiers that in front of a gun, there is a beautiful woman, there is a beautiful uh, uh, house. So implicitly, you understand that this is an, an, an indirect encouragement. So uh, he encourages soldiers to, to commit sexual violence, uh, not only to ne neutralize the enemy, but also in a kind of reward uh, for soldiers. Because young people, uh, uh, soldiers, some soldiers like having sex, uh, like, like to rape. Uh, and according to them, after rape, they, they could feel psychologically strong uh, uh, as individuals, but also uh, uh, as a team. Uh, but but uh, as Mark, uh, Ma 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 Mark has uh, emphasized too, this is rare for sexual violence to be directly ordered. And the order may take many forms. Uh, one, of, one soldier told me the, the, he, he, they received the order in the form, oh, go and pay yourself. You go and pay yourself. It's like a personal reward rather than uh, a direct attack to the enemy. But it can be a direct attack to the enemy in some uh, circumstances. Uh, and another thing that uh, Mark mentioned is about marriage. And uh, during uh, during the pre-war period in the DRC, mar marriage as a strategy of rape was was common, especially for young people who were unable to marry because they didn't have a dowry. So they could organize themselves in the community, especially if you, you want to marry. When the girl was on her way uh, fetching water or going to farm, the young man could call his friend and they could grab the girl 
uh, lucky thing and 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 brought her in in the young man room and 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 the, the girl could get raped and once the rape was committed the woman was not allowed to quit the uh, the house so he she remains uh, his wife so yeah so like this a kind of socioeconomic explanation of rape but what i would just want to mention is that the lack of socioeconomic means of will not necessarily lead to sexual violence because currently in the DRC, we see married men, married men committing sexual violence against young girls, men who are 60, 70, raping uh, girls who are 15. Uh, these men have their wives, uh, but they commit uh, sexual violence against uh, uh, other, other ladies. So the causes are, are, are really, really complex. And uh, uh, as, as Dara has mentioned, we. So there is no single cause. We we have complexity uh, of, of causes, and uh, and Mark also uh, spoke about the, uh, the 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 ideas of masculinity, the the the, the cultural beliefs behind uh, uh, sexual violence in, in, in Sierra Leone. So in in the in the DRC, uh, sometimes both civilians and soldiers explain rape as a strategy to to punish uh, women. And, 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 and their community. For example, in the DRC, uh, a, a girl who was fought as pride in the community, the, the, the young boys of, of, from the community organized a gang rape against her and the goal was to reduce her pride. So especially if she thought that she was more educated, if she doesn't, she's not submissive to young men from the community. And the, the, the young boy said, okay, one day we're gonna teach you a lesson and, and, and rape was a lesson. Uh, and then some soldiers told me uh, uh, that, especially if, if there is a female leader in the community, uh, sometimes they target her or, or, or a, male, uh, a, a, male, a male leader, they may rape you because of your position. They want to lower you socially, they want to lower your status and then the, um, uh, they, 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 they rape you. So these are complex social, social cultural causes of sexual violence. But as I said earlier, that and unfortunately, when the interventions on, on, on sexual violence, they take sexual violence as a disease. Okay, they will treat the victim by providing uh, some medicine, uh, but usually they overlook all, uh, all these complex uh, social factors, which are very important to address for prevention purposes. Uh, I'm going Thank, to you very, Thank, you. Thank you very much, Ali. I think uh, you have also emphasized as Dara and Mark, you know, the complexity of these issues. Uh, that said, I think these underlying causes, the patriarchal power structures, these gender norms, these beliefs, these gender ideologies, uh, you know, make it, make it possible um, in the first place to have this horrendous uh, type of uh, violence. Uh, Mark, I want to turn to you, but I also have some questions here from people uh, in the audience. And one is also about, you know, how does a society recover from such widespread, uh, such widespread violence? And uh, what can you tell us about uh, Sierra Leone in, in the in the aftermath well uh thanks chantal and thanks ali and, and dara for your very very helpful comments and interesting comments um the recovering is is uh it takes place usually in, a, in an organized way in what they call communities which are rural almost always and in villages and the idea is to try to um bring um the former soldiers and the former um, wives of soldiers to be accepted um susan shepler who's written on uh, very uh, profoundly on sierra leone has found that these communities found it easier to accept the the, the boys back than the girls and the girl the children uh the female youth who came back as as bushwives that they had much trouble more trouble 
being accepted back in communities because of those children in particular. Um, so it's a mixed bag. I would say the, 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 in terms of demographically, in terms of proportion, the, the, the challenge with that, that approach of, of, of coming together, there's Fumble Talk as an NGO that does this to this day, is that so many of the ex-combatants aren't there. They're um, living with each other, um, the males in separately from the females in general, um, in cities. And they, they did not go back into the villages because they weren't accepted. Um, and I think some of them were more comfortable outside, you know, with former combatants um, in cities. Um, there's a big tradition of ex-combatants being motorcycle taxi drivers in Sierra Leone, for example, virtually all of them are um, for the ex um, uh, female combatants and, and wives. Um, as I said, sexual violence, I mean, sexual commercial sex work is extremely common as a profession, as a way of surviving for them and their children. So it, it, it's a mixed bag. I think there's been real success in, in some villages, um, but in, in larger ways, uh, I think um, the, the ex-combatants are pretty much on their own, many of them. So in a way, you're saying, you know, the patriarchy comes roaring back after the end of the of the conflict. Uh, the fact that you say that the boys are easily more easier accepted back than than the girls says something about that. Uh, Dara, I want to turn to you because you had a number of issues that you wanted to raise as well. Yeah, thanks. And just on that last question. Um, I haven't been to Sierra Leone for a, lo a long time now. Um, so uh, I was interested to hear Mark's comments in part because I think they reflected my own experience from the last time I was there, what I observed. So in some ways it's it's a little sad to hear that it hasn't gotten better in more <laughs> recent years on some of those dimensions. Um, I also wanted to say that I think um, often we assume, I think, as uh, people who care about this issue or even scholars that study this issue that sexual violence, even on a massive scale, is sort of permanently devastating. And while it is very true that, of course, there are lots of long-term negative consequences to mass rape, I think there is some hopeful research that has come out along these lines. Um, I wanted to recommend to people in the webinar in particular, some work by um, Carlo Kuss, who has done research in Sierra Leone um, about the aftermath of sexual violence. Um, and what he, he's found is that um, it's, there, there are some um, com communities that have been widely affected by sexual violence. Um, in some cases, he uh, he sort of pushes back against the idea that these communities are permanently devastated, that actually he observes that there is a lot of coming together um, and some um, a kind of community um, co coherence uh, in, in the aftermath of, of sexual violence. And so I think it suggests that that people are incredibly resilient. I mean, that's something I was very inspired by during my own fieldwork in, in Sierra Leone is that um, even though there was this awful civil war, mass sexual violence. I mean, we didn't haven't really talked about a lot of the other forms of violence, amputation, child soldiering, um, all sorts of other wartime atrocities. Um, people are incredibly resilient, I think. And so um, that I think is a, is a little bit of a hopeful um, uh, uh, piece to end on, uh, thinking about the, the aftermath of widespread violence like that. Um, but so I wanted to, to return a little bit to uh, some of the constellation of factors that Mark mentioned and related also to some of Chantal's comments about um, patriarchy. So some of the other factors that Mark uh, cited as being important in terms of widespread sexual violence in Sierra Leone were um, sort of the issue of orders or at least tolerance of sexual violence, this um, factor about young men being unable to marry, and then finally the kind of role of emasculation. And actually, I think all of these factors are, are 
quite related to one another. So I just wanted to make a few comments along those lines. Um, first is um, the kind of issue of the inability to marry. Um, it reminded me very much of some work by Valerie Hudson and some of her uh, co-authors where she's written about um, young men, especially lower status young men um, who are unable to kind of achieve the ideals of masculinity in their particular social context. And this could be the result of, as she has um, argued in the case of, um, for example, China, where there's widespread sex selective abortion that has led to excess men or missing girls, depending on your um, way of framing the problem. Um, but essentially, a lot of lower status young men who there just aren't enough women to marry, right. And so they, um, she argues that this is widely destabilizing, um, in part, because a lot of these men are kind of drawn into violence. Um, and she's argued something similar in other contexts, uh, where there is an inability of lower status young men to marry, for example, polygamous contexts, uh, where higher status men have multiple wives, leaving fewer women for lower status men. So essentially her, her argument here has to do with um, the inability of young men to achieve these ideals of masculinity and how the outcome of this might be violence. Um, in the case of, of Sierra Leone, as Mark has argued, as other scholars who have studied Sierra Leone, um, while it is the case that, that some of the rebel organizations and including the RUF recruited maybe even the majority of their fighters through abduction, um, some of them also recruited their fighters through um, through volunteering and through some of the innovative surveys that were done by Jeremy Weinstein and McCartan Humphreys in the immediate aftermath of the conflict. We know that rebels were, um, some of whom were volunteering to join the RUF were attracted by one of the main factors that why they said they were wanting to join the rebels was access to wives, access to women, access to sex. Um, and so we know that this promise of access to wives kind of feeds into this sort of inability for certain young men to, to, um, uh, the, uh, to, to marry. Um, this is all related to sort of the broader topic that kind of runs as a thread throughout um, Mark's book about the issue of, of masculinity and emasculation. Um, and again, I was sort of reminded from a scholarly perspective of some really interesting work done by uh, psychologist Joseph Vandello and some of his co-authors. Um, he introduced the idea of uh, precarious manhood. Um, and what he argues is that manhood or um, masculinity is something that has to be, and he, I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with this framing necessarily, but I just want to present it as kind of food for thought for, uh, for the panelists and for the audience, that manhood is something that, unlike womanhood, um, is something that must be demonstrated and maintained and defended. And so um, what he argues is that um, when masculinity is threatened or is under threat, that often the response is a kind of a, a violent um, or aggressive response. And so this is part of why, going back to sort of the start of my earlier comments, why I, in my work, try to uh, understand the puzzle of why the RUF in particular was the armed group or was the sort of armed group context where um, that perpetrated the vast majority of the sexual violence um, and that uh, the R RUF was also the group that abducted most of their fighters, which I think in this framework can be understood as a kind of threat to masculinity, the response to which might be um, violence, aggression, forms of sexual violence. Um, and that the RUF recruited their fighters. One of the main differences, I argue, is that the RUF recruited their fighters through abduction more so than any of the other armed groups that were active in Sierra Leone. So okay. that might be one sort of putting it into the broader context of masculinity, emasculation, um, this kind of inability to marry. And then going back to this other factor, the sort of puzzle of the lack of orders, both in this particular case in Sierra Leone, but also in a lot of other cases. Um, and this is the lack of um, orders is sort of termed um, by Elizabeth Wood, political scientist um, at Yale, as, as a idea of violence as a practice, 
which she argues mm -hmm. is between a kind of strategy and opportunism. It's it's this kind of cat, this middle gray area of violence that's not directly ordered, but is tolerated. Um, and so that I think also relates to some of Mark's factors. Thank you, Dara. Uh, we're nearing almost the end of, uh, of our webinar. I also want to point people to the research of Ali uh, because he shows at the individual level how uh, men bounce back and that, uh, you know, they, they can redefine their masculinity and emasculation is not a permanent or static uh, dynamic. Um, I want to give all of you uh, one more round, but I would like you to focus on, okay, what are the sort of policy implications of this? And for you, Mark, in particular, uh, you're making this connection with pop culture, uh, terror and war. What do policymakers sitting in the State Department, at the NSC, at the UN, you know, what should they take away uh, from your work in first instance? Um, and I'll give you the last uh, word, Mark. So I'll go first to Ali, uh, then to Dara, and then to you, Mark. Ali. Uh, so, uh, Chantal, the, the question you asked me, would you repeat it? Sorry, I lost you. I, I think the question for you in particular would be, given your research on uh, male uh, mm -hmm. survivors of sexual mm -hmm. violence mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that, you know, men redefine themselves and, and can bounce back. Uh, mm -hmm. What implication? What policy implication does that research have? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, or a yeah. programmatic yeah. implication, if yeah. you want? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Chantal. That that a very important question. Uh, uh, so I conducted a case study uh, with, with 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 male survivors, but I I I, I chose one. I, I I made a study particular particularly with one. Survivor, because he 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 demonstrated a, a a higher capacity of of resilience after a, a brutal rape uh, perpetrated by a arms group uh, in Eastern DRC. Uh, the literature often shows that uh, when male survivors are raped, they they lose their sense of masculinity. They feel emasculated. Uh, but what we learn from this uh, from from this research that I, I, I just published is that masculinity is is not uh, a static idea. It's a, a dynamic. As that I see, it can be maintained. Uh, it can be reaffirmed after a, after a, after a loss. And 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 this man particularly, when he experienced sexual violence, uh, uh, first of all, he took some important steps to uh, to recover. First. He migrated from his native village because the, the community knew that he was exposed to uh, to sexual violence. Then he decided to move and and uh, and live in a, in a in a in a in a new village. But also he 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 developed his skills like public public speaking skills. Uh, but also he, um, he 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 wanted to find a job. Uh, he want uh, he he went to the hospital. He did so many things you could. Uh, the people would read the, the article and understand. Uh, but what is important, he sometimes he, he, he demonstrated peaceful masculinities and sometimes sometimes violent ones. Uh, like when, when because he, he had a sense of losing his masculinity after rape. Uh, and to, to, to test his masculinity capacities, he he was engaged in violent uh, sexual behavior. Like he had three children with women. Uh, uh, with, with women who were not his wife, uh, because he was trying to to to, to test whether he was still uh, a man. Uh, uh, so what is important for policy is, is that sometimes assistance to male survivors it can it can remasculinize like it can lead to the process of remasculinization instead of uh, you know uh, helping a man effectively not to be not to be uh, violent. So. We, we we have to choose between peaceful uh, and violent masculinities when assisting male survivors because what they ask 
will not be necessarily peaceful. Sometimes will, they will seek to demonstrate uh, very violent masculinities. Oh, sorry. What you're saying is that sometimes these programs sort of reinforce traditional notions of masculinity where the the man has to be the protector, the provider, etc. And that uh, when you are developing programs, you should be careful not to uh, reinforce those traditional conceptions of masculinity. Dara. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm afraid I don't have any um, brilliant policy solutions <laughs> based on our based on the factors that we've discussed. But I do think there are some important lessons potentially for policy space, policy discourse practitioners. Um, I, I think first and foremost, uh, Mark's research and um, the kind of conversation that the broader community of scholars is having more generally suggests that um, sexual conflict related sexual violence can happen on a massive scale, even in the absence of direct orders in the absence of uh, sexual violence or, uh, being uh, directed as part of a strategy as part of a weapon of war, that there are all kinds of other complex and nuanced ways that sexual violence can take place. And so um, I know there are some um, an, ongoing conversations about the kind of costs of always framing massive sexual violence as a strategy of war. Um, I think this uh, kind of contributes to why that we should be cautious about, about doing that and framing sexual violence that way in, our, in the way we talk about it in policy spaces. Um, I'm also gonna give a sort of um, scholarly response, I suppose, <laughs> which is that I think, as I said before, Mark has just pointed out some factors that we just don't know enough about and so I think from a policy perspective, it is so essential for us to understand um, some of these factors, um, the, the role of pornography, um, the role of drugs in how they um, interact with, with people on the ground during conflict and, um, and, and the, the wartime violence that gets perpetrated. I just don't think we understand anywhere near enough about this. So uh, um, kind of supporting more analysis and research into that, I think would be a very important policy implication. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say on this is that on the issue of drugs, um, Mark writes, I think so powerfully um, about as kind of how these drugs were administered, right? And in some cases, the they were essentially forcibly given to fighters or they were, they were, or to combatants, or to the the women who were um, associated with these armed groups, they were put into the only food that was available, the only beverages that were available, um, and so people really had no choice but to take these drugs. And I think for me that raises so many questions about agency and how we think about perpetrators of wartime violence. It really complicates our views of um, the. The quote kinds of people that perpetrate even extreme forms of wartime sexual violence. And so um, for me, I think that that also is a really important lesson for policymakers and practitioners who I, I think it's just it, it becomes kind of um, uh, easy to demonize um, uh, perpetrators of these terrible, terrible forms of violence. Um, and I think Mark's book helps remind us just how incredibly complicated um, these, these conflicts are and the, the reasons why ordinary people, and I, I do think it's important to remind ourselves as, as Mark does so powerfully in his book that the, the perpetrators of sexual violence and these wartime atrocities um, are truly ordinary people. They're just ordinary young men in desperate circumstances. And in many cases, how do we, how, how do we understand and explain how such, such individuals can perpetrate such terrible violence? And um, part of the answer it may, may lie in, in this kind of um, uh, drugs and, 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 um, and, and all, of, all of that nuance. So um, that's potentially a lesson, I think, also for, for policymakers. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Uh, and yeah, I would like to echo, you know, the, the conflict-related sexual violence as a strategy of war or a weapon of war has become very popular in the policy community. Uh, but I think the reason why it has become so popular is because it allowed policymakers to just point at a few bad apples and not at the broader structural underlying causes uh, that um, 
that make uh, conflict related sexual violence you know such a complex uh, such a complex issue uh, mark i want to turn to you but i also want to um, let you know and maybe you can speak a little bit to that because you've done research in many countries in the world um, and people have asked about, you know, what's going on in Sudan, what is going on in Haiti. Uh, I think there are some similarities uh, between uh, between these different cases and in terms of, you know, factors um, that can help to explain uh, why this violence is happening. But then I really want you to focus sort of on the on the policy recommendations and particularly, you know, coming back to, to Marley, <laughs> Bob Marley, Tupac and Rambo, uh, you know, the importance of these pop icons. So I uh, thank you, Chantal. And, and I really enjoyed listening to Ali and, and Dara and yourself <clears throat> um, about, about this discussion of these very deep and disturbing issues. Um, I, I think the, the linking thing to me is um, how we see the perpetrators. I, I'm concerned not from a policy perspective, but also I think people get involved emotionally um, that we pathologize masculinity. And when we do that, I think we don't have no way out policy wise or any other way. Um, because, because these are, as Darrow was saying, and I think Ali has, Ali's stories makes very clear. These are these are young people who are given a, a kind of uh, the boys a kind of masculinity which is crazy. They can't meet it. Uh, they can't not. They can't avoid public humiliation. Um, and the outlets that are given to them are often violence. And so. Um, I think it's important to understand those, whether it's Sudan or Haiti or um, DRC or Sierra Leone or in fact anywhere else. So how do these, how do these guys, these um, pop culture figures influence uh, these ideas? I think that the, the deepest thing and one of the things that was so striking with Sierra Leone up to this day is how very unpopular these male youth are. The losers at the bottom are despised. The number of, of names that they're given by scholars, as well as people in the countryside, um, is remarkable as misfits. I mean, just to this day, people think the reason that there was a war in Sierra Leone is because of those bad boys. So when you're a bad boy, where do you turn? When you're a, a female youth and you have no control over your future, where do you turn? No, you don't exist. You're no one. Um, and you're being pummeled by the people in power who are men, overwhelmingly. Um, so where do you turn? And I think that's where this issue, these are profoundly alienated young people who have nowhere to turn in their society. There is no, nobody's interested in their voice. So in these kinds of situations, um, where do they turn? Well, let's look at this example that, that, that Marley says in one song, because I feel like bombing a church now that I know the preacher is lying. So who's going to stay at home when the freedom fighters are fighting? And, and as I think most, one of the most powerful things that, Mar that Tupac says uh, with reference to this work is, he says in uh, Only God Can Judge Me, which is a very profound title for, for a song, and it radiates across the world that only God understands me. And his, he says one of the key lines in that, in that song is, I've been trapped since birth. That idea resonates across the world. Um, and then when you get to Rambo, he's shot at in the first movie, and he keeps saying, but I didn't do anything. You're attacking me. I didn't do anything. So how does this work in terms of policy? The status quo doesn't work. What we think of as functional from the perspective of majorities of young people in this super youthful world are dysfunctional and they're being blamed for things that they can't control. 
And so that's the power of, that's what we can learn from the power of Marley and Tupac and indeed Rambo is, is that people turn to them, young people, because they're getting instruction and validation, validation, uh, which is important because they can't, can't get it anywhere else. And so I think when we look away at from uh, pernicious governments uh, that are really antagonizing young people, um, when we look away from the issues of police exploiting young people in, in, in extreme ways and young people having no rights as well as no voice, um, I mean, I think my take on all this is why are they most of them so peaceful? I know when we discuss sexual violence, we focus on violent young men, but the, the amount of, res, of resistance that they have to violence in most cases to me is utterly remarkable. Um, and so uh, in terms of policy, I think we have a lot to learn if we look at what we think of as the status quo and learn from alienated uh, young people about how they interpret the situation. A whole new world comes up. If you look at the world, um, the ordinary world to see, for example, also from the perspective of an insurgent group, what do they see? What, where are the weaknesses in society? They're often the same places, which is people have no rights. They're being attacked for no reason. state forces are on the issues. Um, so uh, there's a lot to learn on what we think of as acceptable. And when I think we move out from that perspective, um, we have a lot to learn from these super alienated young people and indeed how they interpret um, pop culture uh, to make their life more meaningful and to make sense out of the craziness that's around them. So there's a lot that we can do policy-wise by learning from these young people. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we have a few more minutes actually. So I don't know if Ali or Dara, you want to add a few words here? Ali? Yeah, thank you very much, Chantal. So uh, what, what I would like to, to add is about uh, uh, female survivors of, of, of sexual violence in certain con uh, contexts, especially here in the DRC. Um, uh, women are resilient as well uh, after, after sexual violence because the common idea in the literature is that uh, uh, after sexual violence, women get ex excluded from, from the, the, their community. And, and this does not hold true all the time because like in the DRC, there are communities in which almost everyone was raped. Uh, so all women in different households were raped and, and many men as well. So when, when, when it, is, it is a collective problem, uh, sometimes it does not lead to, to rejection because people in the community understand it as a general uh, uh, problem. In state, they provide support uh, uh, for survivors. So uh, I, I went to a field work recently in Canola, and, and I found that there are so many women who got married after ha having been abducted by rebels uh, because it, it was a general situation in the community. So no one blamed another for uh, uh, for that. Um, yeah. So so the, so the idea that the women get excluded, uh, they, they they are marginalized. Of course, it is true, but it is not. Uh, it is not always true. And there is life after sexual violence. So there are women who who, who, who have better economic situations than they were before, before rape, uh, because like they went through empowerment process after sexual violence, and we need to do research on the, 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 the reconstruction, social reconstruction process uh, after sexual violence, instead of remaining with the idea that they are marginal, marginalized, they are excluded, they are powerless, they have agency uh, in one way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ali. I think you're making an important point that uh, one of the issues is how do we or how do societies reconstruct and, and remake social relationships uh, that are maybe then also more equal and less 
less uh, exploitative as they were before. Uh, Mark, one last word from you. Okay, thank you, Chantal. Thanks everyone again. Um, I, I mean, I think the, 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 the reasons for why people, you know, why sexual violence is so um, uh, pervasive in some places and not in others is, is a real question, I think, for us to still probe and why in some situations it's not haphazard, um, it's actually a feature of terror. And I think we can, my last point would be on this issue of how, how Sierra, uh, Sierra Leone's example can really help us understand um, the utility of terror um, as an insurgent group uh, or as a violent extremist group um, to, to radiate power beyond your numbers um, and to make you seem more powerful than you are uh, as a group. Sexual violence really fuels that and can support that. And I think it's important to understand that. And I would encourage one of the things I noticed, Chantal, in the research is that there were a lot of, um, of, of scholars on Sierra Leone, of which there's a fantastic amount of really incredible information about that war. But some, I would say a good number of scholars don't really, that really get, got to the point of being obsessive. Um, and I, I think that's really important for us to keep in mind is that some people, uh, some of our scholars, you know, I don't know why they don't look into it, um, but I think it's really important to see this front and center as a way to understand war is to dig deep into this issue, even if it's disturbing for us, uh, the issue of sexual violence and to try to really understand why it's happening and what drives perpetrators, and in this case, I push it forward so, so aggressively. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank all of you, Ali, Dara, Mark, of course, but also my colleague, Roxana, who is hidden behind the, the symbol of, uh, of women in international security, but without whom we could not have organized this, this webinar. Um, I urge all the participants in this webinar also to um, look at the follow-up email that we will be sending, where we will also have the links to the various articles, books, and uh, other interesting materials, including the uh, materials of the Missing Peace Scholar Network uh, that um, will also have a lot of resources for you. So with that, thanks again, Mark. Congratulations again with your terrific book. Ali, congratulations with you. your article. And Dara, you, congratulations, and thank you for all your work on these issues. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.